Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I'd like to review Aircraft Carrier Survival. It's a nifty little game by Gambit Game Studio. We manage an American carrier against the Japanese in the Pacific Theater of World War II. This review is based on a partial completion of the campaign across about 30 hours. You're all busy people, so let me answer your most pressing question first. Are you going to enjoy it? The 30 second spiel is that you have to manage a carrier's resources to meet your goals while staying alive. You have a limited number of planes that you have to use to attack enemy fleets while protecting allied fleets and your own carrier. Everything takes time, so you have to manage your air flights to maximize your performance. Make the wrong decision and your planes will have to ditch into the sea. Or even worse, your carrier will be defenseless against an incoming attack. The game will appeal to people who enjoy seeing well-designed plans come to fruition and take pride in being efficient. Fans of the Pacific Theater will also enjoy many of the historically accurate touches that have been integrated into the game's design. If that sounds like something you like, then stay with me and I'll go deeper into the details. There's many naval games out there, but most of them focus on their strategic level. You tend to manage many ships across a theater and each is abstracted into a bunch of numbers. You have attack, defense and other values, but you're really managing pieces on a chessboard. But aircraft carrier survival differs in that you focus on a single one of those pieces. You'll have ships escorting you that can provide you with bonus abilities, but the focus is on managing the actual operations of a single carrier from the perspective of the ship's commander. And since this is a carrier, the focus is naturally on air operations. That will involve planning, launching and recovering flights. Assigning your officers to manage different types of operations. Making sure that you have enough anti-aircraft guns available and enough damage control teams to survive enemy attacks. Sounds simple enough, right? But it quickly becomes quite complex. A key aspect of the game is that you never have enough resources to comfortably do everything at once, and every action takes time. This is particularly applicable to managing air operations, and many subtle details are taken into account in the design of the gameplay. As you might expect, you have a limited supply of planes, and there's many tasks for you to accomplish. Different missions require different types and numbers of planes. If you're running defensive combat air patrols, then you'll need fighters. If you're launching a reconnaissance mission to find or identify the enemy, you'll need dive bombers. If you're launching a strike, you'll need a mix of planes. The first detail you'll encounter is that they have to be brought up from the hangar by the elevators. On the first carrier type you get, you'll only be able to bring up one plane at a time. Each squadron has three planes, so bringing up several flights takes a noticeable amount of time. You can only have a limited number of planes on deck. With a fully crewed air department, your first carrier can have six squadrons on deck. So if you have a lot of planes on deck and you have to change your mission priorities, you'll have to move planes back to the hangar, which again takes time. Even after the planes you need are on deck, launching them takes time. Send out a six squadron flight and you're looking at close to an hour just launching. On top of that, if there's planes of a different type ahead of the ones you're launching, then they have to be moved before the right planes can move to their launch positions. That means even more time required. Then once they return, the planes have to be recovered. That takes more time than just launching them. By default, planes will be left on the deck, but if your deck is full, the squadrons will be sent to the hangar, which takes even longer. A maximum size flight will take hours to land and send to the hangar. Flights have a bit of time before they run out of fuel, but once they do, they'll crash into the sea and the squadrons will be lost. You're likely to have multiple missions taking place at the same time. They all have to be landed before they crash, and you might be looking at half the day spent just landing planes if you sent out several big flights. Now factor in that the Japanese are going to attack you or your allies. You might be in the middle of landing several flights when suddenly a strike appears on your radar coming right at you. Do you have enough time to pause landing operations? Change the launching mode, which might take a lot of time if you have a lot of planes on deck. Bring up planes from the hangar and finally launch protective fighters. Or do you risk damage to your carrier in order to land flights that are about to run out of fuel? Things can get hectic pretty quickly. And the best thing is that all of these conflicts in your decision making are realistic and there's many accounts of them happening during historical carrier battles. Accounts of the Battle of Midway speak of Japanese commanders being conflicted between deciding to land a returning strike or launching missions. The wrong decision led to the loss of carriers and managing this type of conflict in needs are at the core of the game's design. This kind of basis on authenticity is excellent for immersing players into the game system. The design also does a very good job of abstracting away mundane aspects that might not add to the player's fun. So for example, 
You won't be managing aircraft supplies beyond ordering stores to be replenished each evening. There's other aspects that you'll have to manage in order to successfully run the carrier. They're not as complex as air operations, but they do add to the demands on your time and give you a more complete experience of carrier management. You have crew, but they can't be everywhere at once. You can fully man air operations and run at full speed, but you'll have to have skeleton crews on damage control, engineering and aircraft guns. Hopefully nobody gets seriously injured because the medical bay is empty. Or if you have a heavily damaged carrier, you'll have to focus your crew on repairs, which means that they're not going to run large air operations or be traveling at full speed. You'll be even more short-handed if your men are wounded. You'll have officers, but they can't be everywhere at once, and you'll have to choose what missions they plan for you. You won't be able to run multiple reconnaissance missions, multiple airstrikes, and have multiple fighter flights to defend your forces. You'll have to concentrate on one type of activity or a bit of everything, never everything at once. With both crew and officers, you assign them to different tasks, and you're able to reassign them to different locations as your needs change. But it's also important to note that reassigning people takes way. time. If you do this in the middle of a busy battle, you'll be leaving both posts the shorter people. If enemies do manage to get to your carrier, you'll see fires and malfunctions happen across the interior. Maybe flooding too. Your crew will probably also suffer injuries. Do you have enough damage control teams to look after the wounded, keep the damage from spreading, and repair the damage? Usually your teams will automatically deal with the type of damage they're assigned to deal with. But if there's a lot of damage, you might have to reassign crew from other departments to help out. Or maybe even personally direct the teams to prioritize the worst issues. The immersive nature of the gameplay's design is enhanced by the animations included in the game. When you look at the interior view of the carrier, you'll see people working away at their jobs. The hangar is full of planes ready to be taken to the elevator. When a squadron of planes needs to be moved on deck, you'll see little men getting into position and physically pushing the planes to their new position. Damage control putting out a fire will involve little people using fire extinguishers on the flames. Generally speaking, most animations are simply visual in nature, and their purpose is to immerse the player into the role of managing the carrier. So while the people working in the interior of the carrier are moving about, they're just there as background figures. But it's very well done in many cases, and one thing that I've been impressed about is that when planes on deck are brought down to the hangar via the elevator, an animation will play in the interior view, showing the elevator coming down with a plane. Similarly, if you call up a squadron, clearly a lot of care and attention went into this. A notable exception to animations being just part of the background is deck operations. There, the animation of the little sailors matter because they actually carry out operations. For example, if a plane crashes while landing, the damage control team will be physically moving to the deck and physically pushing the plane into the sea. Planes being moved about on deck will be pushed by little men. This all happens as a result of your orders and helps to enhance the player's immersion into the game. Most missions will not require your direct involvement, so if you're sending out a protective fighter patrol or a flight to find and identify enemy fleets, you won't have to do anything other than making sure the mission is available and manage the preparation and launching of the flight. But strikes are different. Enemy fleets are composed of different ships and these add up to an offensive and defensive rating. You must choose between different maneuvers to maximize your airstrike's own defensive and offensive ratings. You'll select from a variety of cards to place in one of the five slots. Each card will have an offensive and defensive rating, as well as a special property that can be combined with other cards to give bonuses to these ratings. Enemy ships in turn can have their own properties that will affect your strike's ratings. If your airstrike's defensive rating is lower than the enemy's offensive rating, your squadrons will take damage. The lower your defensive rating, the more damage you'll take. If your offensive rating is too low compared to the enemy's defensive rating, then you might not cause damage. The ideal is to get your defensive rating above their offensive rating to ensure your planes all return safe and sound, while causing as much damage as possible. The card-based strike system is an exception to the generally immersive gameplay principles in the rest of the game's design, particularly because some of the enemy properties are just random and don't seem to have any ties to reality. For example, a non-combat supply ship might cause your cards to lose values, or a submarine might affect your ability to use a type of plane. In reality, none of them will be able to affect a group of planes. Even when those penalties are tied to battleships or cruisers that historically would hinder an airstrike, some of the penalties are excessive, forbidding the player from using an entire class of cards or planes just has no basis on reality, and this is worsened because the player just doesn't have enough cards to begin with. 
It's certainly not something that I would consider to be game breaking or anything of the sort, but it does cause significant frustration when enemy fleets are effectively not worth attacking because a couple of properties on submarines cripple your strike. The campaign follows a similar format to that of most games. There's individual missions where you have to meet goals set by the campaign. Successfully completing them will grant you command points to purchase assets and upgrade points that you can use to upgrade your carrier, the air squadrons or the escort vessels that you can take on missions. Meeting good performance goals will grant you medals that you can award to officers to increase their skill and unlock extra maneuvers to use in strikes or you can award those to crew squads to improve their performance. There's an alternate sandbox mode where you take on randomly generated missions. As you travel across the map, you'll also get reports of optional encounters that you can take on if you have the time. One key aspect of the sandbox is the integration of battle and campaign activities. Many games pause time in the campaign map, but in this game, all time passes equally. So if you start an optional encounter but take too long to finish the battle, that might mean that you'll fail the mission that you were supposed to do. You'll have to keep your global priorities in mind even during battles. Another little touch is that where you ended your battle will also correspond to where you return on the global map. So if you move across the map in a battle, you'll be moved in a similar manner in the global map. Those aspects of the sandbox feel well done, though I should mention that I haven't played enough of it to comment on how it develops in the longer term. Fundamentally it's a management game, just like many out there, but the designers went out of their way to make the gameplay mechanics and the challenges you face as realistic as possible from the perspective of a World War II carrier commander. This bases on realism combined with complementary animations, serves to immerse the player into the role and the scenarios that he faces. Aircraft Carrier Survival is a tidy little game that I really enjoyed as someone who's both into history and war games. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments. Feel free to leave a like, subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified when new videos come out. See you soon.